When seen through the lens of North Korean propaganda, he looks like the happy winner of a best job in the world contest. Each time he's out in public, he has the air of a man marveling in the discovery of a fabulous country that his parents built just for him. A country where he has a hand in just about everything. Drawing up plans for a new quarter of Pyongyang. Being a lifeguard for the youth of North Korea. Sampling the biscuits which will soon flood the regime's groceries. Overseeing the growth of the chicks on the state farms and even acting as an advisor to the country's hair salons. Arduous days, but days where he can still find the time to try out the latest rides at the capital's amusement park. These absurd, amusing, but also terrifying images are the only ones we have to help us understand this young man, who is at the controls of a nuclear power. Kim Jong-un does not give interviews, so we have decided to go and meet those who know him best, in an attempt to draw a clear portrait of him. Our journey begins in the heart of the Swiss Alps, in Bern, the capital of the Swiss Confederation. This is the home of one of the biggest North Korean communities abroad. It's a discreet community, whose activities have nonetheless attracted the attention of a member of a consortium of investigative journalists. There is a historical explanation. Switzerland is a neutral country, a member of the United Nations in Geneva and other international bodies. And North Koreans have always had access to Switzerland with its peaceful side and its respect for privacy. Many famous people have sent their children to be educated here in Switzerland. These are probably the reasons that compelled Kim Jong-il to send his children to Switzerland. A study of Swiss administrative documents reveals the existence of a Mr. Pak, for whom in 1992, the North Korean embassy in Switzerland requested a visa and a posting to Bern. The visa request bore the names of three children, Chol, Hun and Mi Yang. The names were only slightly altered and the birthdays were identical. Mr. Pak's children were in fact those of the North Korean dictator Kim Jong-il. We knew the children were here, we knew their real identities, but it was not a problem for the Swiss authorities. It was even seen as a boon. Why? To maintain links with the country, which had already cut itself off from the rest of the world. The unusual family spent a year living at the embassy in a residential suburb of Bern. Joel, the eldest, enrolled at a nearby international school for the children of diplomats and businessmen. His brother, Hoon, joined a state school in the town. He spoke German with his classmates. After a few difficult months, he was said to be a rowdy loner, but he finally made a handful of Swiss friends and settled into school life. The boys' school results weren't bad. They were sometimes mediocre, sometimes all right. And he was very much into sports. And he was particularly interested in basketball. He was very keen and quite good at it. Around this time, the Pack family moved into an ordinary apartment near the school. Visitors were not welcome. But there were photos of the property on the estate agent's website. 
showing a standard middle-class family home. Living here meant the children could enjoy a free and easy life with their friends. They sometimes had lessons in Swiss democracy at school. They even got to visit the Swiss parliament. And then, yes, he made friends. Some of them even told us that they were invited to his home to play Game Boy, etc. We also know that Kim Jong-un used to play basketball with his neighborhood friends, not necessarily of his own class, pretty much every evening. And that he was a perfectly pleasant kid, like all kids of his age. The pictures we have of Pak Hun are in sharp contrast with the images we have of Kim Jong-un. How can we be certain that this is the same man who spent his entire adolescence in Switzerland? Judicial identification experts compared the two images. Facial spacing, ears, teeth. There seemed to be no possible doubt. Added to which, another clue was unearthed by the Swiss Secret Service. A North Korean woman by the name of Ko Yong Hee regularly arrived in Switzerland by private plane. The Swiss agents who tailed her suspected she was smuggling precious metals. But the truth was something else altogether. So she would arrive and usually stay two, three or four months and uh, she would stay at the house too. But she would also go off on regular shopping trips in the great capitals of Europe. Or there would be big family get-togethers. I was told about a family reunion which took place in a hotel at Interlaken, for instance, where the family rented out a whole wing of the hotel and met up there. During the 90s, Kim Jong-il's private life was a state secret. Nobody knew about his three mistresses and four children. And when his health started to deteriorate, North Korea's neighbors were worried about who would succeed him and what might happen if Kim Jong-il were to disappear suddenly. But within the Kim family's secretive bosom, the decision had long since been made. The eldest son, Kim Jong-nam, would have seemed to be the natural successor in the Confucian tradition just as Kim Jong-il had inherited power from his father. But Kim Jong-nam had committed several gaffes, among them an embarrassing arrest in Tokyo with a fake passport. He had wanted to visit Disneyland with his family. The second son, Kim Jong-chol, educated in Switzerland, was considered too soft, even too feminine by his father. Kim Jong-un may well have been the youngest son, but he was also the son of Kim Jong-il's greatest love, Ko Yong hee The former dancer would play a significant role in the corridors of power. Ko Yong hee played an important part in ensuring that her son took over the reins of power. Kim Jong-nam, the eldest son, already had an important role in the country's hierarchy with an elevated position at the General Bureau of Data Processing, where he specialized in communication networks. But since Kim Jong-un took control, Kim Jong-nam has found himself in an awkward position. He can no longer return to North Korea. The 17th of December, 2011. North Korea was in mourning. Kim Jong-il, the shining son of the 21st century, had died just a few days before. It was time for the propaganda machine to set up the funeral scene. The funeral would also be the confirmation of the youngest son's accession, which had been confirmed to North Korea and the rest of the world a year earlier. Kim Jong-il was ruling the country or, you know, basically had senior position in the country for quite some time before he became the leader, at least 10 years, um, that he, is, he was involved. And Kim Jong-un, I think, it all came very suddenly. Um, they did it, the propaganda, they did a bit of 
going back and sort of trying to create a story about how he was being trained many years in advance. But that wasn't the case at all. I mean, the fact of the matter was that his father um, had, had the first stroke, and that's when they started becoming concerned about succession. And then he died quite suddenly. And I think the young fellow was not ready. There was a plan, I think, to have him become the next leader. But I imagine they were thinking five, ten years, not one year. And so, you know, I, I think it was very clear from the funeral and everything, you know, the way he looked and the way he was behaving, that he was in shock and not really ready to take over. Kim Jong-un's problems had already begun. Did the aging generals gathered around his father's coffin see such a young leader in a favorable light? Kim Il-sung, the founder of the nation, staked his claim by leading the anti-Japanese guerrilla army during the Second World War. Kim Jong-il was the regime's second in command for 15 years or so, and then assumed power after 50 years. Kim Jong-un, however, was a mere 26 years old with no experience and no reputation to precede him. So in order to keep his grip on the reins of power, he embarked on a monstrous purge. The regime needed to be represented by a whole new generation. Today, Kim Jong-un needs to connect with people who remember the great famine from their childhood. I believe it will be harder to maintain solidarity between the elite and the leader than it was for the two previous regimes. Things could be rather fraught, and so the power structure will be built on a foundation of differing interests and terror. You know, I, I think that there probably is a lot of internal churn there because what seemed to be clear is that after Kim Jong-un did take power, he was trying to um, move some of the business concessions and the political power in the military that his father put there, right? His father believed in so-called military first politics and move it over to the party or at least balance out the party and the military. Um, all of the generals that were with Kim Jong-un by the hearse of his father in the funeral procession are all gone. None of them are left. And so very clearly he's wiped out a group and is trying to bring in a new group. The most prominent victim of the purge was just behind him during the funeral. His uncle, Jang Song Tech, married to Kim Jong Il's sister. Since the 70s, this member by marriage of the family had been at the very heart of power. His brothers were powerful generals. He himself had held a number of key posts in the armed forces and the economy. When Kim Jong-il's health first started to become a cause for concern, his name was mentioned as a potential successor, or at least as a regent to the dictator's young son. Two years after coming to power, Kim Jong-un decided that his apprenticeship was over and had his uncle executed, along with most of his closest relatives. For us, Jang Sang-tak was a very competent man. I worked with him. He was funny and kind to his subordinates. He took good care of us and worked hard. Certainly the news of his uh, arrest and then his execution were quite surprising to many of us who study this country. But I think what was the most surprising was the written statement that came out um, explaining why he had been killed. You know, in the past in North Korea, when these sorts of things happen, they happen very quietly. It's a car accident or it's a sickness, and there's really not much explanation given. But in this case, you know, a very clear explanation, in ma many ways exposing vulnerabilities inside of North Korea. The charge sheet accused Jan Sang Tech of wanting to overthrow the regime. This was a tacit admission of a struggle at the heart of the power structure. He was also accused of being an unfaithful husband and a corrupt communist. And rumors of his fondness for young girls were confirmed by the official press.
Jiang Sang Tech's public execution was very damaging for the regime. North Korea is a deeply Confucianist country where respect for one's elders, especially relatives, is ingrained. Murdering his own uncle was more likely to harm the people's loyalty to Kim Jong un than consolidate his power. I think that the members of the elite who lose respect for their leader could also turn away from him. In order for his accession to power to succeed, Kim Jong-un decided to use terror to subdue the regime's old guard. He then concentrated all the key posts and surrounded himself with those loyal to him. I think that Kim Jong-un is in charge. I don't think that there are puppets behind him uh, because I think the system is designed to only have one person in charge. And so, uh, and everybody must demonstrate their personal loyalty to him in order to survive. Twenty million Koreans live in the city of Seoul, the capital of South Korea. Twenty million people more obsessed with their own success than with Kim Jong-un. However, closer scrutiny reveals that the whole city is ready for war. The military's control over the city makes it an impregnable citadel. A vast underground network was conceived as a shelter from any attack by the north but people no longer notice the gas masks and the emergency rations provided in ever-dwindling numbers in the underground stations. I'm not worried about war. I've done my national service. Their nuclear capacity, on the other hand, that does worry me greatly. I don't understand why he wants to develop nuclear weapons. To blackmail us? To threaten us? To get something out of us? Or just for his own personal glory? I'm not really afraid of war. Their nuclear threat seems to be their only survival mechanism. The North Korean border is only 30 kilometers away. It's an impassable, demilitarized zone two kilometers across with hundreds of thousands of soldiers either side of it. Seoul is well within range of cannon fire. The soldiers in the south can see villages in the north. Unlike his father, Kim Jong-un personally inspects the advanced posts, which are the greatest threat to Seoul. The main difference that was felt in the early days of the Kim Jong-un era was that he seemed much more belligerent and hostile than Kim Jong-il. This was particularly noticeable in his military policy. It was very public. He didn't try to hide it. He stressed the importance of operations designed for a potential confrontation with South Korea. He increasingly put his armed forces on a war footing. This approach was illustrated by the training and exercises that the North Koreans were subjected to. Kim Jong-un made his first North Korean propaganda appearance a year before his father's death. He was made a four-star general, signifying his arrival at the heart of power. In North Korea, power means first and foremost the army. I believe that he attended uh, for a period of time, perhaps maybe six months, uh, one of the military uh, academies. Uh, they have given him some titles, uh, and of course, he, you know, the, the way that they're creating the myth is that he planned the Chonun sinking and the shelling of Waipido. So I, I don't believe he has any credible military experience, but I think that they are trying to create that, that myth. You 
you know, he was given the title as a four-star general um, in, uh, in one of the people's assemblies as they were making the transition. But not, in, not any experience that we know of. The propaganda says he's, a, he's an artillery expert. Uh, so they try to create a myth around him that shows that he's a great warrior, a great military man. And I'm sure for the military in North Korea, you know, they, they probably don't like that. You know, that this young fellow with no experience all of a sudden gets four stars uh, and is considered one of the top military brass in the country, even though he has no experience. <laughs> The North Korean army consists of over a million men and six million reservists. Morale-boosting inspections of all units is a daily obligation for the great leader. But the army's thousands of tanks and hundreds of aircraft, inherited from Soviet-era Moscow, are all but obsolete. Pyongyang, and so 90 miles, 20 miles to the border with the DMZ, you, you, you don't need such conventional, sophisticated weaponry. You need the manpower, the, you know, the uh, multiple rocket launchers. I mean, within 90 minutes, it could be a disaster. So, and then there's also the asymmetrical side. I mean, we're looking at the military in a conventional sense with conventional weapons, and then we're saying, oh, the priority has been the missile and the nuclear program, absolutely. But there's also asymmetrical warfare, looking at other capabilities, like cyber capabilities and, and what have you. And, and, and elements of weapons of mass destruction. It's not only nuclear, but you've got biological programs, you've got chemical programs. So I think this is a government that has invested heavily in their military, but it, always, it doesn't always come across in their convention military capabilities. It's a, it's a myriad of cap capabilities. And some of them are very potent. I mean, we all have to care about North Korea. Let's be practical. North Korea has nuclear weapons. It's the ninth nu nuclear weapon state. The assessment is from six to 12, maybe even more nuclear weapons, right? And they're developing their programs. They have a uranium enrichment program to build nuclear weapons. They have missile systems. They have the SCUD, they have the NODONGs, they have the TYPODONG. They're building the KN-08, which is an intercontin intercontinental ballistic missile, which is a mobile missile, solid fuel, so it's great capabilities. So North Korea is persisting with their nuclear program, their missile program, their, and, the, and the prospects of proliferating some of that, selling some of that material. Kim Jong-il's nuclear program was his grand project. But his son decided to carry it on and even to intensify its development. While its conventional arsenal was not up to the job of fighting its enemies, the atomic bomb became a North Korean obsession. Despite international objections, a huge amount of resources was poured into the project. Pyongyang believed that owning the atom bomb was the only way the regime could survive. It is the only deterrent to its great enemy, the USA, with whom it was at war during the 1950s. Washington perfectly well understands the relationship between the superpower and the small Asian country. The memorial to the Korean War is just a few blocks away from the White House. Since the 1953 ceasefire, the American government has kept a close eye on the Korean crisis. 30,000 soldiers are still stationed on the south side of the demilitarized zone. Crises and crisis management scenarios are constantly being re-evaluated. This show of strength is seen by Pyongyang as a direct threat to its survival. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, they fear the Ceausescu end, uh, they fear the Qaddafi end, the Saddam end, all those, 
those leaders who have lost because they didn't have nuclear weapons, they made agreements with the United States, or their people rebelled, in Ceausescu's case, uh, they don't want to end up uh, in those cases. And when they look to South Korea, uh, you know, they, they don't believe that they will be given, uh, uh, you know, a future in South Korea. And clearly a democratic South who would try and send to jail their own presidents, you know, they can only imagine what they... They would do to North Korea and, you know, to, to the regime, uh, given the atrocities uh, and crimes against humanity that they've committed. North Korea's goal is to, uh, if, if you will, uh, to, to place North Korea in a situation so that uh, the, no one in the rest of the world would dare attack North Korea. Uh, having said that, while the media today has tremendous focus on, on this question, can North Korean missiles reach Alaska or, or California or wherever, in reality, North Korea today has the capability of transferring weapons of mass destruction anywhere in the world through its trading companies, their affiliates, and a very sophisticated shipping network. So North Korea already has the ability worldwide to deliver WMD anywhere. North Korea is already a nuclear threat. But it has also been developing some of the world's most powerful cyber warfare units. For example, they attacked the South Korean financial system, as well as Sony's film studios in the US, in the wake of a comedy movie which openly mocked Kim Jong-un. You know, many of us who have negotiated with North Korea, uh, and I'm one of, certainly one of them, I have great respect for their capabilities. But those who have not spent much time in North Korea or dealing with the North Koreans, they say, you look, this is a country that can't feed its people. If you have malnourishment going on and so forth, and you have this economic development, which is minimal, if anything. I mean, the public distribution system doesn't work. You compare North Korea to South Korea, I mean, there's no comparison. North, I mean, South Korea is a is a, is a modern uh, of a country that has a significant GDP and per capita income is high. And North Korea since the 60s has just gone down and down, having been at a high level at one point and going down and down. So they've not done that in, in, uh, in, in that way. But they have, but we should never underestimate their capabilities. When they put their mind to it, they're very effective. When they put their mind to a nuclear program, they're very good. No one. Many people said they could never have a uranium enrichment program with spinning centrifuges. That's sophistication. Of course they could. Missile delivery systems, of course they could. You mentioned cyber. I'm of the school, yes. If they put their mind to it, they don't need an internet system per se. They need people who are focusing on cyber technologies, the tools necessary and how you do that and so forth. And they're very good when they put their mind to it. So I have high respect for the North Koreans when they, when, they focus, when they focus their attention and put the resources behind it on, 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 on capabilities, building capabilities. One thing every North Korean leader has understood, and he does as well, I think, if they lower their guard, in their perspective, if they lower their guard, they will be treated by the major powers as the used furniture of history. They'll simply be discarded, walked over, ignored. Otherwise, why pay any attention to them? So they have to make sure that people care about them, that they, people don't see just a dark spot on the map, which is the f favorite thing when we show, but understand that this is a real uh, operating, not failing country with 24 million people that are somehow going to continue to exist and become more vibrant in Northeast Asia. That's a big, <laughs> that's a tall order to fill. And who knows if he'll be able to achieve it.
In order to maintain his grip on power, Kim Jong-un decided to fight a war on two fronts. One of these was the preeminence of the army and the apparatus of repression. The young leader spoke openly about the country's poverty. He claimed he would not be able to sleep until his people had an adequate standard of living. From his youngest days, Kim Jong-un spent a long time with his father's Japanese chef, who became his close companion. The Japanese chef recalls the future dictator's innermost nocturnal thoughts. I remember one night, we started talking at about 11, 10 p.m. When we had finished, I looked at my watch. It was nearly 5 a.m. We spoke of many things. He told me, I've been to Europe, to Asia, to Japan several times. The shops are full of food. But in my country, there's none. Something should be done. Then he said, I think we should follow the example of China's policy. When I heard that, I realized that he was determined to go down the route of economic liberalization and reform. Every day, propaganda portrays Kim Jong-un as the great orchestrator of the renaissance of North Korea's agriculture and economy. Early results were modest, but the country seemed to have consigned to history the famines which decimated the population during the 90s. You, you know, in his first speech in April 2012, I got the impression that his, one of his main goals was to convince his own people and the rest of the world that this was, in one sense, a new North Korea. Many of the things that had happened in the past were of the past. We our People's Army must be the embodiment of our great general's slogan, Help the People. The People's Army's soldiers and officers do more for the people than they would do for their own families. Our people are the finest people in the world. They have faithfully supported the party in face of great challenges. They should never have to tighten their belts again. They should be able to benefit fully from the riches of socialism. That is our party's firmest resolution. His focus <coughs> is on the future. Now, he's going to be able to build the North Korea he's hoping for. And it looks to be something, obviously, more prosperous, um, able to stand up better against South Korea, even though they'll never catch up to South Korea. And they have a military strong enough so that they have to be taken seriously. North Koreans do not live in abject poverty like they once did. We no longer have an absolute famine. We now live relatively well. There's just a gap between rich and poor. But there is no longer extreme penury. You may see awful images of starving North Koreans, but that was 10 to 15 years ago. It isn't the case nowadays. North Korea uh, is churning internally as we speak. There are amazing changes uh, occurring within that country. Kim Jong-un is allowing an unprecedented number of people to leave the country, to learn about the basics of business, to learn about um, international economics, to learn about how to transition from a controlled economy to a market economy. Now, this is remarkable that he, he is allowing this sort of situation to occur. Uh, North Koreans are now able to go to Singapore to learn about the basics of business. Uh, North Koreans go to Hong Kong, they go to Vietnam. 
Uh, as we speak, there are North Koreans in Canada uh, learning about international economics. And at the same time, North Korea is actually allowing uh, a certain number of people, including some from Singapore, to go into North Korea and to discuss the basics of business. So this is a different day, a different world, and it is impossible at this point in time to ascertain what this will mean and what the consequences will be. From what we know anecdotally from people who have been in the, not just in Pyongyang but in the countryside, there are resources being devoted to development, housing, infrastructure, some extent food, maybe in, uh, uh, in, the, in the agriculture area, it looks as if there, there are some reforms or changes that are going to lead, could lead to increased harvest. None of these things at this point are real big. And anybody in North Korea who's, um, who's implementing them probably is a little bit worried that they might get reversed because it's not yet clear that they've been completely and totally endorsed from the top. But there's a cumulative effect. A new economy for a political beast born of the Cold War. Just like when China's Deng Xiaoping opened the country for business while playing father of the nation. But North Korea's psychological control over its people reaches a whole new level, like that of a secretive sect. Will it be able to survive this new openness? I think in general because they, they have no problem with getting cash, right, through uh, small projects like Kumgang Mountain or the North-South Joint Industrial Complex. But something that really opens the country up to, op to free market forces that allows for free and open exchange, these are all things that may make them richer, but it is seen as a threat to political control. Um, and that's what we've seen throughout Asia. You know, if the economy starts to grow, you get uh, middle class incomes. They start demanding more political freedoms. You know, this is what we saw in Taiwan. It's what we saw in, the, in, uh, in South Korea. We've seen this throughout history in Asia. And I think they, they're very threatened by that. So they're not willing to, to take the big steps in terms of economic reform, even though this young fellow spent some time in Switzerland, right? was educated in the West. You know, I think for, that, for exactly that reason, he understands the threats that come with trying to open up too much. For Kim Jong-un, it's a matter of survival. After the years of poverty of his father's reign, North Koreans need to be given a new sense of hope if the country is going to stay together. His cheerful appearances and chubby frame contribute to the resurrection of the image of Kim Il-sung, who he has come to resemble physically. In North Korea, even the smallest child in the street loves Kim Il-sung. He was the great leader. During his time, people ate well and were not poor. It was from the reign of Kim Jong-il that the country experienced the worst poverty. So Kim Jong-un is trying to show that he is not like his father, but like his grandfather, whom everybody loves. And that's why he tries to be like his grandfather now. Grandfather Kim Il-sung, the revered founder of North Korea, is still the official eternal president of the country. At times during his reign, its development was faster than that of South Korea, thanks to the unconditional support of the Kremlin. But when the Soviet bloc fell, Pyongyang had to change its tune. Its economy fell apart, and under Kim Jong-il's rule, the country endured the Great Famine. By adopting his grandfather's style, Kim Jong-un seeks to recreate the mythical glory years. He wants to make a link between this supposed glorious past and the new generation, brought up during the dark days, and now being sent all over the world to learn about economic reforms. A new generation which sees a leader in its own image, who enjoys basketball and theme parks and is happy to mingle with the general population in front of the lenses of the propaganda machine. Whereas Kim Jong-il clearly found it difficult to even shake North Koreans by the hand. 
It seems to me it's a combination of a very deliberate effort to have him be different from his father, to be more open, <clears throat> at least to appear more open to the people, to mix with them more freely. Uh, there's one wonderful uh, episode, at least to me, a couple of them actually. <clears throat> one of them is when he went to uh, one of the newly built apartment houses. And in, in the process of welcoming this couple, he sits on the floor with them and has his wife sitting beside him like everybody's Korean mother. I just, you just can't imagine Kim Jong-il ever doing anything like that. You might imagine Kim Il-sung doing it. It's possible. Um, the other thing was when uh, Kim Jong-un was, was uh, on-site guidance for a uh, army unit, a female army unit. And when he was leaving, <clears throat> he didn't just take a picture with the entire unit. He stood there and the young women came up one at a time like he was a rock star. They grabbed his arm and had their pictures taken. I just, I was so astounded. I could not imagine uh, that ever happening before. Something that seemed equally unimaginable was to hear Kim Jong-il's voice. Throughout his reign, the only propaganda put out was either silent films or images. He never spoke in public. Kim Jong-il couldn't speak. He had a stutter. So he couldn't speak in public. I only ever heard his voice through a door when he was having a meeting with his chiefs of staff. He stammered. He struggled with language. Kim Jong-un, on the other hand, he can talk. Moreover, he talks like his grandfather. He even imitates his voice. So in the beginning, it was even said that Kim Il-sung had been resurrected. It had become like an actor's job to recreate his image. Our nuclear capacity is our guarantee of protecting our national sovereignty. It allows us to build peace, prosperity and power, as well as the happiness of the people. There is a generational difference, for one thing. In my eyes, Kim Jong-un and Kim Jong-il have different styles. Kim Jong-un studied abroad, so would have a closer understanding of international criteria. Therefore, he seems more normal than Kim Jong-il, who had too many wives, and wanted to keep his family, especially his sons, hidden. Kim Jong-un will not be like his father. So I think he's trying to demonstrate that he has a relatively normal presidential style. But how can one follow a normal path when one comes from a family with such history? Kim Jong-un seems to have chosen to allow a degree of transparency where his family is concerned. Since the beginning of his reign, he has shown off his wife. She accompanies him on his many excursions. Immaculately turned out, she occasionally treats herself to luxury toiletry items. North Korea has for the first time its own first lady. Always smiling, she is a symbol of modernity and diversity. Kim Jong-il, for his part, had a great many secret mistresses, most of them selected from among the ranks of the regime's official artistic community. This troupe was conceived essentially as a harem for the dear leaders. Kim Jong-un's mother, like his wife, issued from these ranks. It was at the end of his adolescence that Kim Jong-un could begin to make his choice.
Kim Jong Un was never forbidden from going out with girls. But he just wasn't interested. He was just interested in sports. He was always playing basketball. But one day, I felt relieved. That day, amongst the pleasure brigade, there was a buxom young lady. Kim Jong Un called me over and said, Fujimoto, look at those puppies. I was so relieved to hear him say that. I told myself, he's a lad, and everything's going to be fine. There is one other woman to whom the regime is giving an increasingly significant profile. She was seen behind Kim Jong-un during his father's funeral, although the propagandists never named this young woman in mourning. She's the dictator's younger sister, Kim Yo Jong. When she was playing and her trousers or her nappies would start to fall down, it was always Kim Jong Un who noticed. Watch out, watch out, he would say, and he would pull them up. He was so fond of her, and he's still fond of her today. Kim Jong-il was equally fond of his little sister. So he's doing exactly what his father did, just the same. What's interesting is the strong women he, he surrounds himself with. Uh, there was a picture of him when he opened one of the fun parks. He's walking, not only got his wife, he had his aunt, Kim Jong-il's sister. He had uh, his, his father's last consort, who was apparently a very strong woman. I can't remember if there was one or two more. So it's not completely a patriarchal <laughs> system there, it seems to me. He's, I guess he's listening to women as well. Kim Jong-un is grooming his sister for succession in case any crisis, like a health issue, should befall the regime. In late 2014, the dictator disappeared for a few months because of a surgical procedure on his ankle. Even then, his transparency in the official media was astonishing, portraying a limping convalescent. This remarkable contrast with the image of a living god, so commonplace in Korea's daily life, almost seems to embarrass even him. Just like when the soldiers he is visiting seem to be completely irrationally magnetized by his presence. There's nothing special about these pictures. It's perfectly normal. Here in North Korea, Kim Jong-un is like Jesus. If you were a Christian and you were to see Jesus aboard a boat by the river, wouldn't you try to follow him? This is no different. Clearly, it's all very far-fetched. The great leader who can make grenades from pine cones, the great leader who can move at supernatural speed, even the weather is linked to his greatness. Every song sings his praises. You can't take it all too seriously. But brainwashing is very dangerous. When people are constantly exposed to songs, videos, and moving or even grandiose stories, they start to believe them. It's what's called mass psychology. This allows North Korean television to present the dictator as an instructor for airline pilots. This scenario may appear ridiculous to an expert, but it's part and parcel of the regime's tenor. One question springs to mind when watching these images. To what extent does the main actor believe in the play? And to what extent has this fever pitch propaganda influenced Kim Jong-un's persona? 
you see humanity and the man smiling and reaching out to the people and engaging. And then you say, my God, how, how could you do that to your own people? How could you have been so brutal to your own uncle? How does that come together? But this is what we're looking at. We're seeing a leader who is, and that's why people say he's, he has not been that rational an actor. On one hand, you see the humanity in the man, the charisma. And the other thing, you see the brutality. And you're saying, what do we have here? At the frontier between the two Koreas, the sentry posts have become tourist destinations. South Koreans come here for a family outing on Sundays to take a look at these vestiges of the separation between the two countries. I don't know. It's difficult to get any real information about Kim Jong-un, other than what's disseminated by the media. But when I see that, I get the feeling that he won't remain in power for long. Even Germany reunified, and Korea is only a tiny little country, yet we remain separated. For Korea to be powerful and prosperous, I believe it needs to be reunified. Kim Jong-un? His demeanor worries me. I think he's too young. He comes across as more aggressive and unstable because he's young. I think he's a very dangerous man. I would uh, uh, say with, uh, stake my 34 years in the military on, the South Korean uh, military would defeat North Korea, but it will be bloody, it will be tragic, uh, South Korea will suffer tremendous destruction, uh, and as I started out saying, the entire world will be impacted, uh, at least economically, if there is a war. Could this final frontier of the Cold War possibly fall? For many Koreans, the question is now irrelevant. Personal and family connections have all but vanished after 60 years of separation. 60 years of watching the Kim family show in Pyongyang. A soap opera which holds the keys to the future of the Korean peninsula.